My name's Wendy Thompson. I'm a clinical academic dentist here in the northwest of England. And my research is about the care of people with toothache, and in particular with a focus on reducing antibiotic prescribing safely so that we can tackle antibiotic resistance. Antibiotics have been the cornerstone of modern medicine and they are life-saving drugs. And when people need antibiotics, they need them to work. So we need to make sure that we use antibiotics only when they really are necessary so that they will work when they're really needed. Antibiotic resistance has been described as a slow motion pandemic. Currently, over 700,000 people die each year from an infection that won't respond to antimicrobial drugs. That's over 2,000 people every single day, and that's set to increase. FDI World Dental Federation published a white paper last year about the essential role of the dental team in reducing antibiotic resistance. And it talks about three main strands of approach. It talks about preventing and controlling infections. And as dentists, that's important. Routine dental care is all about preventing pain and infection, stopping people getting problems in the first place. And that's a really important strand of tackling antibiotic resistance. It then talks about using antibiotics only when they're absolutely necessary. And that, another way of putting that is called antibiotic stewardship. And finally, it talks about the important role of raising awareness about antibiotic resistance and the importance of dental teams being part of the whole healthcare team in all delivering consistent messages that antibiotic resistance is really important and we all have a role in controlling it. There are studies that show that 80% of antibiotics prescribed by dentists, certainly in the UK and the US, are not necessary and that those patients could be treated with procedures instead. So we need to be doing everything we can to reduce the number of antibiotics. And that's not just about individual dentists making a change to, to their patterns of practice, but that's about the whole context, the way in which dentistry is provided in different countries, to make sure that dentists are equipped in their surgeries to provide treatments rather than prescriptions. In dentistry being a business, we have the adage of the customer's always right, except in this case, the customer isn't always right. And so in terms of dealing with patients who really want antibiotics, we've developed a complex intervention based on shared decision-making. It provides dentists the nudge to ask patients, do they want antibiotics? And explaining that a procedure is actually the quickest and safest way of solving their pain. In terms of any negotiation, having the confidence to know and to stick to your bottom line is very important as well. And those are skills that we're not necessarily taught at dental schools. Antibiotic resistance is a problem for the future, but it's also a problem for the here and now. We live in a global world and infections pay no respect to borders. We're going to need to learn how to live with this into the future in just the same way that we're going to need to learn to live with COVID. World Dental Congress is a great opportunity for dentists around the world to learn from each other and to see how dentistry differs around the world. And that's where the magic comes, working at the interfaces between different countries, between different systems. World Dental Congress this year has a fabulous array of speakers and I'm so excited to hear what different people are going to tell us and to hear what the latest developments are from, from all across the globe. What still inspires me today Technology, the hand skills and the intellectual need, also the patients in the focus, right? And this is what we are striving for, for the well-being of our patients. If you see what we what changed in the dentistry world in the last decades, we have so many fields which we are in a way automatically digitized. For me, the main aspect of digital dentistry is to gather as many information as possible right at the beginning of the treatment. The other point is, of course, that we have, I, I call it the island solutions. That means we have digital x-ray, we have the intraoral scan, we have the CAD software, the 3D printing, the milling, the facial diagnostics. We are building bridges from island to island and we continuously connect those islands to a full workflow. This will help us to get out the most of the relevant aspects of a treatment of a patient's case. Digital dentistry has the potential to objectify our profession. 
We are the bad guys. We say, you didn't brush your teeth. You have a caries. We need to do a filling or restoration. Maybe in future we could say, well, our scanner says, okay, over the last three years, you develop here a growing decay. I can help you. Maybe there's an objectification for our patients and a better understanding for their dental health. Another aspect is the functional aspects from the TMJ and the, the, the mandible movements. Let's assume we have a perfect intraoral scan of upper and lower jaw and we need a centric relation. I have an interface which is connected to my upper and lower jaw. But how do I position that in my digital articulator? There is not a real constant workflow at the moment, which I would say is ready for daily office and daily use. One workaround is not the digital articulator, but what I call the virtual articulator. That is where I really cover the movements and I create the interfaces. And this brings me even closer to the patient's real movements. There are still analog gaps in our workflows and we need to carefully consider where do we do a step back even when we work digitally. It's not a digital world and an analog world. Digital and analog forms a dialogue. The main aspect and the decision is what can bring me to this demands the easiest and the most reliable way. What we will see in future is technologies that give us the possibility to come closer to the nature. If we take the technology from carious diagnostics, for example, we maybe can filter out the inner surface of the dentin core and we can distinguish inner surface, outer enamel surface, and then we have 3D printing technologies that can directly imitate that. We have the technologies to provide us much more information, but we also have to learn how to use this technology for the sake of our patients. The FDI World Dental Congress, I think, is uh, the place to be this year. To interact on a neutral and very positive way is very important at these uh, special times. And I'm looking forward to see you there and to interact with you. And uh, learning from each other is one key element in this very challenging but also interesting professional times in dentistry. I'm Finlay Sutton, I'm a specialist in prosthodontics and I sub-specialise in removable prosthodontics which is exclusively dentures. What do I find the most rewarding with my work? The first one is the, the, the massive emotional change that we can make with the patients. What happens to the patient in terms of their confidence and how they feel about themselves is it is it's truly remarkable. The other really exciting aspect of it is I know that it's going to excite other dentists knowing that they can potentially do this for their patients too. Having natural dentition opposing an edentulous upper, how do I make that denture fit against those in the first instance? And also, how do we make the teeth look like they, they match. The key is getting a photograph of the patient when they have their natural teeth. If the patient performs an excursive movement with the jaw, when they've got these wonky teeth at the bottom, it can make the top teeth tip and fall out. So often what I'll do is I'll level the, the occlusal plane and basically either grind little bits off these over erupted teeth or we may add bits to the um, teeth just to make everything level so we've got a nice even bite on that. If you imagine a patient that has these really atrophic ridges and there's not even a ridge there it's just a divot all the way around it's just really good quality dentures will work for those patients. The ones that I find more difficult is where they have just like a little tiny ridge maybe like a class 5 ridge which is not offering very much stability, it's basically flat there. So the way around that is just really good primary impressions, superb secondary impressions, and then getting the bite right perfectly using my gothic arch tracing, 
and then when we actually set the teeth up I just make sure I'm not opening their bite up too much giving them a little bit of space there so it's just following really good set protocols what do we have to get right what is essential that we get right for successful removal prosthodontics it's about not over promising it's about under promise over deliver and so right at the beginning I've got to talk to the patient about look these teeth are going to look great they'll look amazing but they will not function like natural teeth I'll do 70% of the work but you have you do 30% of that in terms of getting used to it and learning how to use it so I really make sure that the patient's on board right at the beginning. We're all going to learn loads from this uh, Congress. We've got some amazing speakers, fabulous lineup of, you know, top world class speakers so that the content is going to be really amazing. There's some unique solutions that come out of these sorts of things. We can just learn from other people in other countries really fast and then we can apply it straight away into our clinical practice. My name is Mark Wolf. I'm the Morton Amsterdam Dean of uh, the School of Dental Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. I concentrate heavily on um, delivery of care to persons with disability, uh, to people that have limited access to dental care. I've evolved to understanding much more about lots of the social and, and physical determinants that, that drive our health and, and you can't be healthy without oral health. We as dentists have to look how to accommodate the person that has the disability. Put yourself in their position, think about what accommodations we can make available, and you know, it changes the world for them. Alzheimer's patient, they can't sit in a chair for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, and get their teeth cleaned. Well, let's see them for 10, five minute visits. Let's, let's work with them to, to, to be able to, to manage their oral health and keep them comfortable and happy as, as they age. Um, our image of, of the perfect white smile doesn't have to be achieved in, in every one of our patients. It's more important that we provide them the care that will keep them healthy and able to eat and, and communicate and, and put a smile on their face. I've had patients that are in geriatric settings that no longer allow people to brush their teeth because they're difficult. Well, if I take away the sugar sources that feed the bacteria that cause caries, we can manage that. This is a total change in the way we think about managing the disease. The management of carious lesions has evolved. I asked the simple question. A patient comes into the office and has a new active caries lesion that you're restoring. If we restore that, have we actually treated the disease of tooth decay or have we actually just fixed the ravages of the disease? But until we start addressing what caused the disease and how we can prevent it, we haven't treated the disease. We may be able to arrest caries earlier, maintain the tooth without violating the area of the pulp, restore it with bonded restorations that don't require the same types of preparations that GV Black defined in, in 1895. We need, to, we need to realize that, you know, in 1895, life expectancy was in the 50s. Um, today, we look at needing to restore and maintain teeth through the 90s. From the tooth standpoint, this is a great time to be a tooth. The 2021 World Dental Congress has the ability to reach more people and more dentists than any meeting that's ever existed before. And this Congress will bring together some of the world's leaders in, 
in oral health, in, in intellectual health, in, in, in thought. This is an opportunity for you to get world-class continuing education. There has never been an opportunity like this before. My name is Paul Abbott. I'm a, an endodontist and I'm also a professor of dentistry at the University of Western Australia. My passion is dentistry overall, but in particular in the specialty of endodontics. A big part of uh, my interest area is dental trauma. To me, it's, it's an exciting area. Um, it, it's also one that has a lot of consequences for patients. You know, anybody that has trauma to their tooth really has now got a lifelong problem. So it's quite a challenging area, uh, but it's also a very rewarding area because we can bring patients back from a you know, fairly traumatic situation. Radiographic uh, examination of teeth is really important. It's the only way we can see some injuries, such as your root fractures or bone fractures. So as part of the initial examination, we advocate the use of what we call a trauma series of radiographs. Follow-up of trauma is really important. We need to take more radiographs to assess the healing, uh, to assess whether any other problems are developing. So it's really important um, to have a good radiographic technique. Diagnosis is the key to everything we do. We shouldn't do any form of treatment unless we have a diagnosis because a patient could come in at any stage uh, of the whole disease process. So we need to understand it so we can make a diagnosis so that we can then do the appropriate treatment. When a tooth has been avulsed, there are, there are many factors that come into the outcomes afterwards. And what we do know is if we replant a tooth, the tooth will stay there, but the problem is how long is it going to last? It largely comes down to how the injury has occurred and what has happened to the tooth while it's been out of the mouth. If the tooth can be replanted within 10 to 15 minutes, then it will have a very good chance of lasting a long, long time. If the tooth hasn't been dry, but it's been put into some sort of solutions, a lot of those cells can stay alive. And so the chances of getting ankylosis and replacement resorption will be less. Resorption is a very complicated process. And initially what we're really concerned about with a lot of injuries is external inflammatory resorption. So for those injuries, pulp necrosis and infection is very, very predictable. And there's also been damage to the external root surface and the periodontal ligament. So they're the injuries where external inflammatory resorption is likely to occur. With external replacement resorption, it depends a lot on what's happened to the tooth. And the two main injuries there will be avulsion and the second injury is intrusions. And that's the sort of situation that can lead to uh, ankylosis. So, in those situations, we still go through the processes of replanting or repositioning the tooth, stabilizing it and managing all the injuries. Our secondary aim in that situation is to preserve the bone. And that bone becomes very useful in the future in terms of uh, being able to replace the tooth with something like an implant. Having the World Dental Congress in Australia is a fairly unique opportunity. It, it doesn't come around very often in our own country, so it's a great opportunity for Australian dentists to participate. We have a, a wide range of speakers coming from all parts of the world, so it brings a whole different perspective. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity for dentists to broaden their education. Mm -hmm.